Okay, everyone. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to day five of ACCA webinar June 2018. Today is going to be our last session and uh, I will try my level best that we can cover as many areas as we can. So we will be starting with the statement of cash flow questions by the name of Monty. Have you tried it last time? Have you tried it on your own? We had discussed yesterday while ending the session that you people will be trying this on your own. Did you people try it? Okay, Liliana is saying that she cannot hear me properly. Can everyone else hear me? Can everyone else hear me properly? Am I audible to all of you? Okay, yes, I am audible to the other students. Okay, so let's start the question of Monty. The question says that prepare the statement of cash flows for Monty for the year ended 31st March 2013. So March 2013 is our accounting year end in accordance with IES 7 statement of cash flows using the indirect method. This time this is a five mark, a 15 marks question. The question says that Monty is a publicly listed company. Its, its, state, its financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2013, including comparative, are shown below. Statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income for the year ended has been provided by the question. So, what was the procedure of starting the answer? Cash flow from operating activities. We first start from a heading and we are going to start from profit before tax. And then we'll be writing some adjustments which includes depreciation and finance cost at least. These two areas will always be there. So this is our uh, basic format. Now the question has given us revenue, cost of sales, gross profit, distribution cost, administrative expenses. And then we have finance cost which includes loan interest by 150 and lease interest by 250 so we are going to add back this interest 150 and 250 both both of the interests will be added back because um, If it is loan interest or it is lease interest both the types are actually interest are, are a part of finance cost So we have added back the finance cost and if you remember we we had discussed that every every adjustment will have a double impact so in the cash flow from operating activities we will be writing interest paid by the amount of 400 as well and similarly we can keep some values for investing activities and some for the financing activities okay so now the profit before tax was 3000. So we'll be writing profit before tax of 3000 over here. We can select these values and apply the formatting. This option we are going to select in the format. Now the question has given us income tax expense of 1000. What do we do with the income tax expense? Is that we prepare some tax payable T account. Let's go and check where is the tax payable given nothing in non current assets nothing in current assets We have deferred tax liability in the non current liabilities and we have current tax payable in the current liabilities. so we can say That we are preparing a tax payable account in which we are going to write the broad down of non current liability and then the broad down of current liability we will be having some tax expense and we will be having some tax paid and then we'll be having the carried down of current liability and the carried down of non current liability. So if we prepare this T account, we're going to get the balancing figure as tax paid. So if I enter the non current liability brought down, it was 800. So I'm going to strike through this. And the carried down was 1500. Again, strike through to remember that we have incorporated it. Current tax payable was 725, which is going to be the broad down, and the carried down is going to be 1250. 1250, 
and the tax expense from the PNL was actually 1000 so we'll be writing 1000 over here so this way we can calculate the the balancing figure the sum of carried down minus the sum of remaining value so we have got a tax paid of 225 this tax paid will be taken to the cash flow from operating activity so tax paid is equals to negative 225 so we have written uh, uh, it on the scratch pad so that we can remember that these values are to be incorporated later on now the question has given us an other comprehensive income of 1350 which is positive which means that the asset would have been revalued upwards and there is a reference of note number one with it so the details will be provided in note number one now let's have an overview of the balance sheet where we have non-current assets property plant and equipment we have deferred development expenditure which was nil at the start thousand at the end this means that we have done some additional development expenditure during the year we have inventory which will be taken to the movement and working capital we have receivables which will also be taken to the movement and working capital we have bank which is going to be taken to the cash and cash equivalents and then we have equity shares which are actually the same this means that no share capital has been issued during the year we have some revaluation reserve which was nil and 1350 now we have retained earnings 1750 and 3200 so what we can do is we can make a property plant equipment t account property plant equipment brought down addition deletion depreciation revaluation and carried down these are the major major parts of the property plant equipment t account So I'm giving a heading of property plant equipment. Now if I go onto the balance sheet and I see the property plant equipment brought down was 10,700, the carried down is 14,000. And the revaluation is 1350. So we can actually can cancel the revaluation reserve that we have incorporated it. And then the question has given us retained earnings. So we actually prepare the movement of the retained earnings to calculate the dividends paid. So brought down plus profit after tax minus dividends will give us the carried down. So the retained earnings brought down is 1750 carried down is 3200 so we can cancel this no movement in share capital so if i go and check the profit after tax it was actually 2000 so equals to carried down minus the sum of all minus the sum of all previous values so we have got a dividend paid of 5 550 is it clear up to now that we have made tax paid we have uh, made the t account of the tax payable we have made the account of property plant equipment we have we have made the retail earnings t account and we can even incorporate the property plant equipment so we can strike through this and let's also make a t account of development expenditure we should know the reasons of movement of every uh, item in the balance sheet so we do not know what will be there but we can say that there can be some addition there can be some deletion there can be some amortization and then the carry down these are the normal values which are possible so zero in the brought down and thousand in the carry down
applying some formatting. So now we know the movement so far of everything. PP, deferred def def expenditure, inventory taken to, uh, taken to working capital, receivable taken to working capital, bank taken to working to cash and cash equivalents. Equity all done. Now we have 8% loan notes, which were previously 3125 and now they are 1400. So by what amount have they decreased? 3125 minus 1400 is going to be 1725. So this means that we have repaid the loan of 1725, which will be taken to financing activities. Repayment of loan notes is equals to 1725. So 3125 done, 1400 done. We are going to strike through this. And then we have some finance lease obligation. So we will be making a T account of finance lease obligation as well, which is now known as lease liability or lease obligation. So lease liability brought down from non current liability brought down from current liability and then we'll be having the uh, addition of uh, assets for the leased repayment and then the carried down of again non current liability and carried down of current liabilities. So lease obligation non current brought down is 900 and the carried down is 1200. You have to ensure that every movement have been reflected in, in, in your working. So brought down current liability 600 and carried down is 750. 600, 750. And then trade payables will be taken to the working capital and current tax is already uh, accounted for. Now let's read the notes. Once we incorporate the notes, we are going to close the T accounts and then calculate the balancing figures. The question says that on 1st July 2012, Monty acquired additional plant under a finance lease that had a fair value of $1.5 million. So we have acquired asset for 1500. So 1500 is going to be added in the lease liability as well as the property plant equipment because the entry would have been property plant equipment debit lease liability credit. So we can say that the addition relating to lease was actually 1500. On this date, it also revalued its property upwards by 2 million. We have also revalued the property upwards by 2 million and transfer 650 of the resulting revaluation this created to the deferred tax. This means that the asset was revalued upwards by 2000 and the entry would have been PPE debit. PPE debit and revaluation reserve through OCI credit. By what amount? By 2000. And then we would have made another entry as revaluation reserve through OCI debit and deferred tax liability credit by 650. And the net amount given to you in the OCI is the net of these two 2000 credit 650 debit. So the net amount is 1350, which was given to us previously. Although in actual the asset has been revalued by 2000. So we are not going to write 1350 over the here. We are going to write 2000 instead. And 650 will be taken to the T account of deferred tax liability. So if we go over here, we are going to add a line. And we are going to say that. Deferred tax. Or we are going to say revaluation reserve through OCI by 650. So now we need to recheck the, the formulas because I have told you earlier that if you are going to cut paste any any formula related cell that may the, uh, the, the formula may be required to be re-entered. So the tax paid is actually 425. So if I go back onto the scratch pad, I'm going to say it's not 225. It's 425. 
let me check the formula again the carrot down sum minus g4 to g7 okay so now we have incorporated adjustment number one entirely the question says that there were no disposals of non-current assets during the period so there is no deletion zero or we can also empty the line the question for this says that the depreciation of the property plant equipment was nine hundred thousand dollars so depreciation is going to be nine hundred in the t account as well as the depreciation value in the operating activities Elvin is saying that Wilson with email address of this has difficulty joining the session. He's asking for assistance. I would request the admin to please please look into the matter. I would request the admin to please look into the matter. So the depreciation was actually 900. We have written it over here as well as over here. Depreciation and depreciation because we remember that every adjustment has a dual impact in the adjustments as well as somewhere else and the amortization of the deferred development expenditure was two hundred thousand dollars so the amortization is two hundred thousand dollars so we are going to write the amortization two hundred plus it is also there in the deferred development expenditure amortization is of two hundred so that is it we have read all of the adjustments now let's close the t accounts tax t account already closed property plant equipment t account if we calculate the sum of the carrot down minus the sum of the remaining values so this is going to be additions paid from the bank So this will be taken to CFI cash flow from investing activities PPE negative 2900 <clears throat> let's also check from a different calculator to ensure that our working is right 14,000 plus 2000 was the carried down minus 900 minus 1500 minus 10,700 so yes it is right we have done retain earnings we have calculated dividend paid and dividend paid will be taken to the financing activities and let's see the development expenditure we have purchased actually the development expenditure So the purchase addition is going to be 1200 and this should be taken to the investing activities. We can call this intangible asset, which is going to be 1200 negative. And then we have lease liability where we are going to find the repayment. So the repayment is 1050 which will be taken to the financing activities repayment of lease liability is equals to negative 1050 so that's it all impacts done let's calculate the sum of these values So the sum is going to be 1500 and then we have the movement in working capital where the inventory is decreasing so we are going to write decrease in inventory this is going to be 3800 minus 3300 positive and then we have increase in receivables 
by 2200 minus 2950 so this is going to be negative now let's see the trade payables the trade payables are also increasing so increase in payables is going to be 2650 minus 2100 this will be positive because increase in payables is going to support our cash now if we see the the entire balance sheet movement has been incorporated except for the bank so let's calculate the sum of these values it is 300 and then we are going to have interest paid and tax paid interest paid was 425 and the tax paid sorry in tax interest paid was actually 400 and the tax paid was 425 so let's calculate the sum of all these this will become the cash flow from operating activities total now we are going to to make cash flow from investing activities where we have purchase of property plant and equipment the purchase of property plant equipment was negative 2900 and we have purchase of intangible asset which is going to be 1200 negative anything else left so the total is going to be negative 4100 let's apply the formatting as well Now we are going to write cash flow from financing activities. Liliana is saying, is the question available so that I can print it? Liliana, if you want to print the question, you can simply print it directly. For example, if you press Control P, you are going to find the question. So you can simply print the question. Or maybe we can have the selection and then print. No. Yes, now. Now you can find the complete question if you if you to if, if you mark the option as selection only. So if so you're going to find the entire question from the start till the end. Now you can print it simply. Are you getting the point, Eliana? This is the way you can print the question. Okay, so now we are on to the cash flow from financing activity where we have dividends paid. Dividends were being paid by 550. And we have written in the scratch pad so that if you forget, we can remember this repayment of loan, repayment of lease liability. repayment of loan repayment of lease liability so the repayment of loan was actually 1725 negative 1725 and negative we have the lease t account as well 1050 so now we can calculate the sum of all of the financing activities now we can calculate the sum total being 1350 which is net net cash inflow or the outflow and then we will be adding cash in cash 
equivalence brought down into it which will give us cash and cash equivalents carried down so let's go and check cash and cash equivalent brought down is 1300 so the total should have been negative 50 but it is positive 50 this means that there is some difference of the amount of 100 so let's check 200 is okay let me use a calculator 3200 minus 1750 minus 2000 this is 550 okay let's check the tax 1500 plus 1250 minus 650 minus 1000 minus 800 minus 725 is a balancing figure of 725 uh, 425 so this is also okay mm. apparently there is no error let's check the lease liability t account it's 1200 plus 750 minus 900 minus 600 minus 1500 so the values are okay let's check if we have taken the cross values right 900 is okay finance cost we had written was also 400 okay amortization is 200 let's check the inventory inventory was 3800 minus 3300 this is also okay 2200 minus 2950 is also okay And if you look at payables, 2650 minus 2100 is also okay. Difference payment outflow, repayment outflow, lease liability outflow. Let's check the sum of this. Sum of this. Let's check the values. 725 is okay. 1250 is okay. 800 is okay. 1500 is okay. And tax expense from 1000. Income tax expenses also okay. Revaluation as of 650 is also okay. Financing activity seems to be okay. So tax account is okay so far so good property plan equipment brought down carried down is okay revaluation of 2000 is okay depreciation 900 okay leased asset 1500 okay the sum seems to be okay retail earnings brought down was 1750 carried down was 3200 profit 2000 dividends are okay Additions 1200 is okay. No error found yet. Okay, the repayment of no the repayment of loan notes is also a cash outflow. Hmm, the answer seems to be completely fine. Increase in payables is also inflow because if the payables are increasing this means that we are not paying them So that will become inflow So apparently everything is fine 
let me check the examiner answer also once if there is any question in the if, the, if there is any error in the question so this is actually june 2013 answer Okay, yes, the mistake have been found that this depreciation is actually negative 900. So if we make this negative 900, this is actually reducing the asset. So 10,700 plus 1,500 plus 2,000 minus 900. And now we are going to check the balancing figure again. So let's use a calculator 14,000 minus 2,000 plus 900 minus 1,500 minus 10,700 is going to be 700, right? So this is going to be this minus the sum of these two comma sum of these two. So if we correct that value right now our cash flow statement has been balanced. So the mistake was actually the depreciation was written as negative. So we have balanced the cash flow statement. One more question in today's session. If you have any confusion, you people can ask quickly. If you have any questions so far. Okay, Wilson. Wilson is reminding me to export the Excel sheet so that it can be sent to you people. So we have now the Excel file which can be checked. And the Excel file is there. Having all of the formulas. Okay, so the first area has been completed. I have, uh, haven't I shared yesterday's answer? I thought I have shared it already. So I'll be sharing today, inshallah. So now cash flow statements has been done. Let's move on to the MCQs of section B. Let's move on to the MCQs of section B. So today we are going to solve section B type MCQs which are going to be which are going to relate to one five uh, OTs relating to one single case. So we have the case right now in section B. What do you have to do is you are going to start reading uh, from the case or from the question. Should we read the case first or, which, or, or should we read the requirement first? What do you say? Yes, Dorota, I will be sharing both the both the files today, inshallah. So what do you think that should we be reading the requirement first or should we be reading the? OK, everyone is saying requirement. That's good. We will be starting from the requirement, obviously, because if, if we don't know the requirement, we cannot study the case properly because the case is too long and it relates to five different uh, five different uh, uh, requirements. So the question says that in accordance with IES 36. Okay. 
Okay, in accordance with IES 36 impairment of assets, which of the following explains the impairment of an asset and how to calculate its recoverable amount? How to calculate its recoverable amount and which of the following explains the impairment? So there are two requirements that which of this following statement explains the the, the impairment and the ex, uh, and the calculation of the recoverable amount. Now the first statement says that an asset is impaired when the carrying amount exceeds the recoverable amount. So is this right or wrong? An asset is impaired when the carrying amount exceeds the recoverable amount. Yes, this is right. And the recoverable amount is the higher of its fair value less cost of disposal and the value in use. Is this statement also right? Yes, this is also right. So A is actually the right answer. That impairment is uh, an asset is said to be impaired when its carrying amount exceeds its recoverable amount and recoverable amount is the higher of value in use and fair value less cost to sell. Let's also read the other options. An asset is impaired when the recoverable amount exceeds the carrying amount. No. Recoverable amount is the lower of no. Both the statements are false. An asset is impaired when the recoverable amount exceeds the carrying amount. No. The recoverable amount is the higher of its fair value cost to sell. Yes. So option C is wrong because one statement is correct and one is incorrect. An asset is impaired when the carrying amount exceeds recoverable amount. Yes. And the recoverable amount is the lower of no. So, so the right answer, the, the right option was actually A in this case. Now the question for this says that prior to considering any impairment prior to considering any impairment. This is something very important. Prior to considering any impairment. What is the carrying amount of telepaths plant and the balance on revaluation surplus at 30 30th September 20x3. So the question wants us to calculate the value at 30th September 20x3 of the revaluation surplus and the carrying amount before any impairment. So let's read the question now. The question says that telepath company has a year end of 30th September and owns an item of plant which it uses to produce and package pharmaceuticals. The plant costs 750,000 on 1st October 20x0. So this is the cost being 750,000. At that date had an estimated useful life of five years. So the asset has a useful life of five years. A review of the plant on 1st April 20x3 concluded that the plant would would last a further three years, three and a half years and its fair value was 350. So on 1st April 20x3 there is some changes. And the, the fair value at this date is 560 and the remaining life is 3.5 years and the purchase date was actually 1st October 20x0. So let's see the questions requirement. Prior to considering impairment, what is the carrying amount of telepaths plant? The question is the question requires the impact of plant prior to impairment. Let's go back. Now the question further says that telepath company adopts the policy of revaluing its non-current assets to their fair values, but does not make an annual transfer from revaluation surplus to retail earnings to represent the additional depreciation charge due to the revaluation. So we do not transfer, does not make any transfer from revaluation to retail earnings. On 30th September 20x3, Telepath company informed was informed by a major customer that it would no longer be placing orders with Telepath company. As a result, Telepath revised its estimates that net cash inflows earned from the plant for the next three years would be 
220, 180, and 200. Telepath company's cost of capital is 10%, which results in the following discount factors. So, need, so these are the discount factors. So if you want to calculate the value in use, we're going to multiply this by 0 0.91, 0 0.83, and 0 0.75. So 220 into 0 0.91 is going to be 200.2. 180 into 0 0.83 is going to be 149.4. And 200 into 0 0.75 is going to be 150. So now let's calculate the total. So this is going to be 499.6. So now this is the recoverable amount. Now what do we need to do is that we had acquired the plant on 1st, 1st October 2020x0 for 750 and then we have revalued the plant on 1st April 20x3 when the fair value was 560. And then on 30th September, we are actually impairment the asset. So now the question requirement is to calculate the value before impairment, which means that before this information, we have to calculate the value. So let's try. The cost was 750 and the depreciation is going to be 750 divided by five years, which is going to give us the annual depreciation into Till 1st April 20x3, how many years, years have passed by? 20x1, September 20x1, September 20x2, and then October, November, December, January, February, March, six months. So this means that two and a half years have passed by. So 750 divided by five into 2.5 will give us the depreciation of 375. So the net book value was actually 375 left when the question is said that the fair value was 560 so the asset has been revalued by 560 minus 375 which is going to be 185 so 185 is the revaluation gain which is going to be taken to OCI and this was value at 1st April 20x3 the question's requirement is 30th September 20x3. So we need to depreciate the asset further by six months. So 560 divided by remaining life was 3.5 years into 6 by 12. 560 divided by 3.5 into 6 divided by 12 is going to be depreciation of 80. So after charging depreciation of 80, 560 minus 80 is going to be 480. So the depreciation is actually 480 and the revaluation reserve is 185. So the highlighter is not working on this. So 185 and 480. These are the two relevant values to us. So let's go down. And the plant has 480, but relation surplus zero, no 300, 185, no 480, 185, yes. So C is the right answer in this case. C is the right answer in this case. Any confusion in this? We have calculated the depreciation, we have calculated the revaluation. And then we have calculated the depreciation again after revaluation. Now the second question is that what is the value in use of telepaths company at 30th September 20x3? We have already calculated the value in use which was 499.6. This is the value that we have calculated. The value in use. So if I go down. We're going to say that 499.6 is the value in use in this case.
Now, next question that which of the following are true in accordance with IES 36 impairment of assets? So which of the following statements are true? A cash generating unit is the smallest identifiable group of assets for which individual cash flows can be identified and measured. Is this the definition of the cash generating unit? Yes, this is true that cash generating unit is the smallest uh, is the smallest identifiable group of assets which individual cash flows can be identified and measured. Now in, in the statement number two, the, the question says that when considering the impairment of a cash generating unit, the calculation of carrying amount and recoverable amount does not need to be based on exactly the same group of net assets. So this means that we can take the carrying amount of any of any other group of assets and recoverable amount of any uh, of any other group of assets. So can we compare the carrying amount of one CGU with the recoverable amount of another CGU? Can we compare this? Obviously not. So this statement is actually false. So B is not the right answer. And one is the answer. So either A or D is going to be the answer. Let's see. When it is not possible to calculate the recoverable amount of a single asset, then that of its cash generating unit should be measured instead. Yes, this is right. Because we if if the recoverable amount of a single asset cannot be calculated, only then we move towards a CGU. So this statement is right. So your answer was actually D in this. So if you see actually we have solved two questions to two MCQs which are general which do not relate to the scenario which two? this one and the first one. This one. So there are total two questions which actually do not relate to the scenario. They are in actual general questions. So you so uh, you can remember this that in, in, in case of section B even you're going to find two questions each which are general. So if there are three case studies two each means six questions are going to be general and 15 from the start. So it means that 21 questions are in actual general in the exam that do not relate to the scenario. Now let's read the last question of the first case. Which says that what is the carrying amount of Rilda company's plant at 30th September 20x3 after impairment loss has been correctly allocated to its assets. Now the question is talking about Rilda company's plant. So let's see. Let's go on to the question case. <clears throat> the screen takes a bit of time to be updated on your side. Okay. So the question says that telepath company also owns Rilda company a hundred percent subsidiary which is treated as a cash generating unit. On 30th September 20x3 there was an impairment to Rilda's assets of 3500. The carrying amount of the assets of Rilda company immediately before impairment were so these are the values before impairment and what amount of impairment are we going to record 30 500,000. Let's calculate in thousands. So the receivables in cash are already at the recoverable amount. No loss in this. First we are going to record the loss in the goodwill. And the new carrying amount after the impairment of goodwill is going to be zero. And receivables is going to be 2500 and total is going to be 12,000 minus 3500. Sorry.
I don't know why this is taking too much of time. Okay. So 12,000 minus 3,500 is going to give you a value of 8,500. Okay, now how we are going to allocate the remaining loss of 1500 remaining losses of 1500 So we are going to allocate the remaining loss of 1500 onto the factory and the plant Which is 4,300 So the allocation is going to be on the basis of percentage 4000 out of 7500 and 3500 out of 7500 Just give me a second. I'm checking if what is the problem with the screen. It is taking some time to update. So just give me a minute. Okay, so factory building is for 4,000 uh, out of 7,500 the sum of both and plant is 3,500 divided by the sum of both. So multiply by the loss of 1,500 was to be allocated. So 4,000 divided by 7,500 into 1,500 is going to be 800 so the loss of 800 should be allocated to factory and similarly 3500 divided by 7500 into 1500 is going to be 700 of the loss to be allocated to this so new carrying amount is going to be 3200 and 2800 now let's see if the sum is is correct 3200 plus 2800 Plus 2500 is 8500. So, yes, we have distributed the amount correctly. Now, the question requirement was to calculate the value of Rilda Company's plant. So, the plant value that we have just calculated is actually 2800. 
the plant value is actually 2800 so your answer to this question is b your answer to this question is actually b Okay, now let's move on to the next question. Now the question's requirement says that in accordance with IES 16 property plan and equipment, what is the depreciation charge? We are going to calculate the depreciation charge to let's call this company A company profit or loss in respect of the machine for the year ended. December 20x4. So we need to calculate the depreciation for December 20x4. So can you read the case quickly and, and calculate the depreciation that you should the that you think should be? Quickly calculate the depreciation that you think should be. done the question says that a company has a company has the year end of 31st december and operates the factory which makes computer chips for mobile phones it purchased the machine on 1st july 20x3 for eighty thousand dollars which had a useful life of 10 years now these two values are important that we have purchased on July 2000 and X, uh, uh, 2013 for 80,000 with a useful life of 10 years and is depreciated on the straight line basis time apportion in the year of acquisition and disposal. The machine was revalued to $81,000 on 1st July 20x4. So the asset was revalued to $81,000 on 1st July 20x4. There was no change in the useful life at that date. So the originally cost of the asset was $80,000. And the depreciation would be $80,000 divided by 10 years. So the annual depreciation was $8,000. And we are revaluing after a year. So annual depreciation would become $8,000 and the net book value was $72,000. Now the new depreciation is going to be nine years. So 72,000 divided by nine years is going to be 8,000 annual dep uh, depreciation. Oh, sorry. From 72,000, the asset was increased to 81,000. So which means that the asset has been revalued by 9,000. 
and now divided by nine years the depreciation is going to be nine thousand dollars so before revaluation the depreciation was eight thousand after duration it is nine thousand and the asset has been revalued on first july 2014 so this means that half year depreciation belongs to the previous one and half year belongs to the new one so the old depreciation was 8000 and for six months it is going to be 8 into 6 by 12 which is 4000 and for remaining six months it is going to be 9000 into 6 by 12 which is 4500 so the total depreciation to be charged is going to be 4000 plus 4500 which is actually 80 500 so your answer is going to be d in this case so the right answer is actually d any confusion in this in section B IS 36 is basically the IS that has been asked the most in the past papers IS 36 is the um, area which has been asked the most Now the next question says that IS 36 impairment of assets contains a number of examples of internal and external events which may indicate the impairment of an asset. In accordance with IS 36, which of the following would definitely not be an indicator? Which of the following would not be an indicator of potential impairment of an asset? So we have to identify which of the following is not an indication. An unexpected fall in the market value of one or more assets. So if the market value decreases, is this an indication? Yes, this is an indication. Adverse changes in economic performance of one or more asset. So if our asset is performing below the normal, is this an indication of impairment? Yes, this is an indication of impairment. A significant change in the technological environment in which the asset is employed making its, its software effectively obsolete so technological advancement making the software obsolete is this an indication of impair, impairment yes this is a, this is also an indication of impairment the carrying amount of the entities net assets being below the entities market capitalization so carrying value is less than the market value of the company is this an indication no this is not an indication if the carrying value would have been higher and the market value would have been lower that would be an indication of impairment that my assets are overvalued as compared to the market but in this case the carrying value is less and the market value is higher so your answer to this question is actually d that d is not an uh, is that d is not an indication of impairment Now let's move on to the next question. Well, the question says that what is the total impairment loss associated with a company's machine at 1st October 20XX? So we need to calculate the impairment on October 20XX. Let's go back to the scenario. And for that, we'll be needing to read the case further. A fire at the factory on 1st October 20x6 damaged the machine, leaving it with a lower operating capacity. The accountant considers a company will need to recognize an impairment loss in relation to this damage. The accountant has ascertained that the following information at 1st October 20x6. The carrying amount of the machine was 60750. An equivalent new machine would cost 90,000. So is this relevant to us? Not at all. The machine could be sold in its current condition for a gross amount of 45. This mentaling cost would be 2,000. So fair value 
is 45 minus cost to sell is 2000 so this value is going to be 40 3000 so 43000 is the fair value less cost to sell and its current condition the machine could operate for three more years which gives it a value in use figure of 38656 so this is the value in use and 43 is the fair value less cost to sell what is going to be the uh, recoverable amount with higher of higher of value in use in the fair value less cost to sell so 43,000 being higher off will become the recoverable amount. So 60750 minus 43,000 is going to be the impairment loss, which is going to be 17,750. So this is the amount of the impairment loss to be recognized. So if I go back to the question and look at the options available, your correct answer is going to be option B 17750 is the impairment loss that should be recognized. Now let's read the next question where the question says that the accountant has decided that it is too difficult to reliably attribute cash flows to this one machine and that it would be more accurate to calculate the impairment on the basis of factory as a cash generating unit. So the accountant thinks that the recoverable amount of one machine cannot be calculated. So uh, he wants to calculate the entire CGU in accordance with IES 36, which of the following is true regarding cash generating units. So which of the following is true regarding cash generating units, a cash generating unit to which goodwill has been allocated should be tested for impairment every five years. Have you studied any such rule? No. The cash generating unit must be a subsidiary of the parent. Obviously not. It may not be a subsidiary. It may be any uh, any department of the company, any uh, any product of the company, any any uh, um, any uh, I would say strategic business unit of the company. There is no need to consistently identify cash generating units based on the same type of assets for from period to period. There is no need to consistently identify CGUs based on same type of assets from period to period. So every year we can make a new CGU. Is this possible? Obviously not. A CGU is, is a CGU. You cannot decide whether it is the same, whether it is same or not. A cash generating unit is the smallest identifiable group of assets for which independent cash flows can be identified. Yes. So your right answer is actually D. That CGU is the smallest identifiable group of assets. Now let's calculate either the question. The question's requirement is that in accordance with IES 36, what will be the carrying amount of a company's plant and equipment when impairment loss has been allocated to the cash generating unit? So this question again relates to the CGU. The question say that on 1st July 20x7, it is discovered that the that the damage to machine is worse than originally thought. The, man, the machine is now considered to be worthless worthless which means that it has no value the recoverable amount of the factory as a cash generating unit is estimated to be 950 so this is the carrying amount and the recoverable amount is actually 950 which means that there will be a loss of 220 1170 minus 950 the loss is going to be of 220 now First, we are going to record the loss of 35,000 in the plant and equipment. So plant and equipment will be left by 300. Apart from this machine, there are other plant and equipments as well. So if I remove 35 from this, uh, the asset which has been completely uh, damaged, it is worthless. So 35 million of loss taken to the machine, 85 taken to goodwill, Net assets has no loss. So 250 and 0. Now, how much loss is left if we see 220 minus 120? So the remaining loss is of 100 actually. The remaining loss is of 100, which is to be allocated between the building and the plant. 
and the building and plant sum of building and plant is actually 800 so 500 divided by 800 into 100 is the loss on building and 300 divided by 800 into 100 is the loss on plant and equipment so 500 divided by 800 into 100 is going to be 62.5 and the remaining value is going to be 4 37.5 and for the plant and equipment it is going to be 300 minus 35 which is 265 Okay, there's some error in the calculation. It's 300 divided by 800 into 100 is 37.5. So the so further loss of 37.5 should be allocated to the plant and uh, uh, equipment. The loss, uh, the previous loss of 35 was of the machine that was worthless now. So total loss is 35 plus 37.5, which is 72.5 and 335 minus 72.5 is going to give us 262.5 so the mistake that i was doing was 300 minus 35 although 35 was already deducted from 335 to get 300 so if we are using 300 we are going to deduct 37.5 from that so your answer is actually 262.5 which is a a is the right answer in this case Okay, Bairam, I will share the, the answer to the ratio question that we have, uh, to the cash flow question that we had solved yesterday. Any confusion in this allocation? We have solved uh, two different type of allocations up to now. Now we'll be moving towards IFRS 5. In today's session, we will be solving approximately 26 questions that are uh, uh, that are a part of the plan. Now let's start from the requirement. The question says that which of the following must exist for an operation to be classified as discontinued operation? Which of the following must exist? For an operation to be classified as discontinued operation in the in accordance with IFRS 5 the operation represents a separate major line of the business or geographical area is this necessary yes because if it is a separate segment only then we can treat it as a discontinued operation the operation is a subsidiary is uh, is it necessary to be a subsidiary obviously not the operation has been sold or is held for sale. Yes, either it should be sold or it should be held for sale to, to be classified under IFRS 5. The operation is considered not to be capable of making a future profit following a period of losses. So is it necessary that I'm going to sell a, uh, a segment which is in losses? Obviously not. I can even sell a segment which is in profits if I'm getting a good amount. So your correct answer is actually one and two, which is option number D. So option D is the right answer in this case. Now we have another general question. I have told you earlier that in the in the section B type questions, you're going to find two general questions in, in, in the case. But this, but this is only a past practice. It is not necessary that in every exam, in every case, this should be there. This is one of the past practices which has been seen in the exam. OK, 
came. So now the question says that IFRS 5 non-current assets held for sale and discount operation prescribes the recognition criteria for non-current assets held for sale. For an asset or a disposal group to be classified as held for sale, the sale must be highly probable. Which of the following must apply for sale to be considered highly probable? Benedicta is saying that she is not clear in the previous question. Yes, Benedicta, can you please be specific? What exactly area is not clear to you? Benedicta is saying why one and two? Okay, actually I've marked it incorrect. This is one in three. One in three. C is the right answer. Sorry. Yes, actually I uh, we had selected one and three and then I have had marked one and two incorrectly. So the selection was incorrect, but the but the solution was actually correct. And I think a lot of people were also saying this. Okay, so let's solve the next question. Benedicta, is it clear? We had actually marked an incorrect selection, although the answer was one and three. Okay, thank you. So now we are discussing that which of the following must apply for the sale to be considered highly probable. If you remember, there are six criteria under IFRS 5, which should be met. The management should be committed to a plan to sell the asset. An active program to locate a buyer should exist. The, the asset should be quoted at a reasonable price. It is expected to be um, immediately available for sale. It is probable that the asset will be sold within 12 months and the management action should not suggest that the plan will either be changed or be withdrawn. These are six areas which should be met in case of IFRS 5. So let's see the question says that a buyer must have been located. Is it necessary that the buyer must have been located? No. An active program should be there to locate a buyer. If we are actively searching for a buyer, the criteria is met. It is not necessary that the buyer should have been located. The asset must be marketed at a reasonable price. Is this required? Yes, the asset should be marketed at the reasonable price. Management must be committed to a plan to sell the asset. Yes. The sale must be expected to take place within six months. No, within 12 months. The correct statement is within 12 months, but the question says within six months. So this is going to be incorrect. So the right answer is two and three, which is going to be A. The right answer is going to be A in this case. So now we have some specific questions. How about, how about taking a break of 10 minutes, quick break, so that we can uh, continue with the, uh, with the rest of the questions. So let's have a small break of 10 minutes quickly, and then we'll be continuing again. So it's 4.20 with me. We are going to resume at 4.30 so that we can go at a stretch. And even if we need to extend some time, we can. So, uh, um, so let's regain the energy to continue in 10 minutes time.
Okay, everyone, let's resume the session. Now the question is saying that what is the employee cost associated with the closure and sale of Neutron Company's factory, which should be charged to profit or loss for the year ended 30th September 20x3. So what is the employee cost associated with the closure? Let's go and see the scenario. The question says that at a board meeting in June 20x3, Neutron Company's directors made the decision to close down one of its factories by 30th September 20x3. And the market and, and market both the building and plant for sale. The decision had been made public, was communicated to all affected parties, and was fully impl implemented by 30th September 20x3. So we have communicated to all parties, fully implemented, the, dis the, the decision has been uh, made public. So this means that the criteria as per IS 37 are met. The directors of Neutron Company have provided the following information relating to the closure. Of the factories, 250 employees, 50 will be retained, retrained, and deployed to other subsidiaries. With the Neutron Group during the year ended 30th September 20x4 at a cost of 125,000. So this is the retraining cost. Do we make a provision for retraining cost? No. In case of redundancy, there are three impacts: retraining, relocation, and redundancy, and any contract termination. So we can say when when we are closing down a business, there are four impacts. We may, may we uh, we may cancel some contracts for which we are going to record a provision. <coughs> we may redundant some of the employees for which we are going to make a provision. We may retrain some of the employees, and we may relocate some of the employees. But retraining and relocation costs are not created as a provision. Only contract termination and redundancy are made as a provision. The remainder accepted, uh, uh, which are the remainder employees? 200. Out of 250, 50 were retrained. Remainder is 200. The remainder accepted redundancy at an average cost of 5,000 each. So we will be paying 5,000 to, to these employees, which is going to be $1 million. So $1 million is the cost that will be paid to the employees. So if you go down, the question wanted us, what is the employee cost associated with the closure? So the answer is actually D in this case, that $1 million is the employee cost which is, which is associated with the closure. Now let's read this next question that what is the profit or loss on discontinued operations relating to property, plant and equipment for the year ended 30th September 20x3? What is the profit or loss on the discontinued operations relating to property, plant, equipment? So let's go back and see the case. The case says that the factory's plant had a carrying amount of $2.2 million. The carrying amount was $2.2 million, but is only expected to sell for $500,000 incurring $50,000 of selling cost. So fair value is $500,000 minus cost to sell is of $50,000. So we are going to realize $450,000. The factory itself is expected to sell at a profit of 1.2 million. So we are selling plant at a loss and we are selling property at a gain. But the question was about the plant. So carrying amount was 2200,000 and we are going to sell it at 450,000. So what amount of loss are we going to incur? 2200 minus 450 is going to be 1750,000. 1750,000 is the value of the loss. Unique is saying that, so sir, the employee cost included is always, yes, basically, uh, Unique, the, the employee cost only relates to the redundancy. 
or it may relate to retraining but we do not uh, uh, but we do not record retraining cost so normally there are four costs contract termination which is not with employee redundancy which is with employee retraining which is with employee relocation maybe with employee but for these two we do not record a provision so only two areas left contract termination which cannot be with employees and redundancy which can be with employees so when the question talks about employee related cost that is only the redundancy cost Welcome unique Tajar is saying sir today's session does not include lease, but please show an MCQ of the lease where rent is in advance if, if possible That's when actually there are different um, Treatments that people follow for lease So what I can do is I can share a document on the lease on the whatsapp group for you people so that you can have um, Some calculation over that because majority of the lease questions are actually outdated questions There are as per is 17 which won't be relevant to you people so that is why I have not included the questions relating to IFR 16. So 1750 is the loss. Let's let's go to the options. 1750,000 loss is in A. So the question was talking about property plant equipment. We have a gain on property. And we have a loss on plant. Why we are not recording the gain because as per prudence as per IFRS 5 we only record a loss We do not record the gain until the asset has been sold. So this will not be recognized until sold This is going to be recorded when the asset is sold Okay, yes Elvin your question <laughs> So let's go on to the next question. The question says that in respect of operating leases and penalty payments, what provision is required in the statement of financial position of new of neutron company as at 30th September 20x3? So now we are talking about operating lease and penalties, probably which which are the rest of the two paragraphs. Let's start reading this. The company also rented a number of machines in the factory under operating leases which have an average three years to run after 30th September 20x3. The present value of these future lease payments at 30th September 20x3 was 1 million. So the, the cost of the lease is actually 1 million to us. However, the lesser has stated that they will accept 850,000 if paid on 30th October 20x3 as a full settlement. So now when we are closing the business, there is no need of of, of of the property being leased or the machines being leased. So we will provide the, the machines back and we are going to pay a penalty of $850,000. So $850,000 should be recorded as a provision. $850,000 should be recorded as a provision against lease. And then the question for this says that penalty payments due to non completion of supply contracts are estimated to be $200,000. So $200,000 penalty is going to be paid on the contract termination. So we will be recording provision for that too. 50% of which is expected to be recovered from neutrons insurers. So we are expecting that 50% will, uh, will be recovered. So should we be recognizing provision of 200 or should we be recognizing provision of 100? What do you people say? The provision should be of 200 or the provision should be of 100? The provision should be of 200 or the provision should be of 100. What do you people think? Because 50% will be covered from the insurers. So should we book a provision of 100 or 200? Tajur is saying 100. What about others? Mm -hmm. Okay, one thing you, you, uh, you people have to remember that we do not consider any amount covered from the insurance. We do not consider any amount covered from the insurance because insurance is an inflow which is uncertain and even if the inflow is probable we only disclose this inflow and we do not treat this 
as an income so whenever the question talks about any amount which will be recovered from the from the insurers you are not going to consider that so we are going to record a provision of entire 200 not 50 percent of that any amount expected to be recovered from insurers is not relevant to us because that is only to be disclosed in the financial statements that will not be recorded in the financial statements so the sum of both the values is going to be one zero five zero triple zero this is the amount of the provision that should be recorded so let's go on the answer options and your answer correct answer is actually c in this case Now let's move on to IFRS 9. This actually relates to IFRS 9 as well as taxation as well as IFRS 15. So there are three different areas in the next question that we are going to solve. Now the question says that speculate company is preparing its financial statements for the year ended 30th September 20x3. The following issues are relevant. Shareholding A. This is a long term investment in 10,000 of equity shares of another company. Long term investment means fair value through OCI. These shares were acquired on 1st October 20x2. These were acquired on 1st October 20x2 at a cost of 3.5 each. So 10,000 into 3.5 would become $35,000. Transaction cost of 1% of the purchase price were incurred. So 1% means 350. So in fair value through OCI, we normally capitalize the transaction cost. So the cost would become 35350. On 30th September 20x3, the fair value of these shares was 4.5, which means 45,000. So the value has increased by 45,000 minus 35350, which is going to be 9650. So 9650 is actually the gain on the investment. And this 9650 should be taken to the OCI. Are you getting this calculation? Further, the question says that in shareholding B is a short term speculative investment, which means fair value through PL. In 2000 of equity shares of another company, these shares were acquired on 1st December 20x2 at a cost of 2.5. So 2000 into 2.5 is equals to 5000. Transaction cost of 1% of the purchase price were incurred. Now the transaction cost is going to be 50. In fair value through PL, we do not capitalize the transaction cost. Instead, we actually record it as an expense. So the financial asset will be of 5,000 and the expense PL will be of 50. On 30th September 20x3, the fair value of these shares was 3, which means the fair value was 1,000. So in the PL, the value to be recorded is going to be gain, fair value gain of 1,000. And transaction cost of 50, the net value to be recorded in PL is going to be 950. Is it clear up to now to you people that this, the the uh, the second shareholding actually relates to the PNL category? Now let's see what is the requirement of the question. The question says that which of the following meets the definition of a financial asset in accordance with IFRS nine? So so according to the definition of IFRS nine, what is a financial asset? Financial asset is cash equity instrument of another entity contractual right to receive cash contractual right to exchange financial assets or financial liabilities under terms potentially favorable to the entity so there are total four important parts in the definition financial asset is cash equity instrument of another entity right to receive cash right to exchange financial assets or financial liabilities under terms potentially favorable to the entity so equity instrument of another entity is this a financial asset yes it is a financial asset a contract which evidences a residential interest in the assets of an entity after deducting all of its liabilities is this a financial asset no instead this is the definition of an equity 
this is the definition of equity so this is not the right answer a contract to exchange financial instruments with another entity under conditions which are potentially unfavorable unfavorable means a financial liability and if it would have been favorable it would have become a financial asset so right now this is unfavorable which means a financial liability and cash is a financial asset so your answer is going to be one and four only which is b your answer is going to be b in this case Any confusions? The admin is requesting for the feedback of today's session. So you have one minute to provide the feedback. Today is our last session. So your feedback will be very important for, for the ACCA to evaluate the tutors they have been offering to you people. So a quick feedback, you have one minute time. Yes, uh, Liliana, you can see, you can watch the uh, the recorded lectures on the VMU channel of Pakistan, of ACC Pakistan. Okay, so let's continue now. Now the next question is that in respect of the financial asset of speculate company what amount will be included in other comprehensive income for the year ended 30th September 20 x3 so what amount will be included in other comprehensive income I think we have already calculated that the amount to be shown in other comprehensive income is 9650 that we had calculated earlier so your answer to this question is going to be A. This is the right answer of this question. Now let's read the next requirement and then uh, we'll be reading the question. That what is the total amount which will be charged to the statement of profit or loss for the year ended 30th September 20x3 in respect of taxation. So now we are going to calculate the taxation which would be relating to the second paragraph, second part, second bullet. <clears throat> the question says that the existing debit balance on the current tax account of 2.4 million represents under our provision of the tax liability for the year ended 30th September 20x2. So 2.4 million debit balance means that this is an under provision relating to last year. So your entry is going to be current tax credit and tax expense debit. So this will actually increase the tax expense. Tax expense debit and the current tax credit by 2400. This is, uh, 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 this is one of the entries that we have prepared earlier as well in the final accounts in day one. A provision of 28 million is required for income tax for the year ended 30th September 20x3. So the entry is going to be tax expense debit and the provision for tax credit by 28,000. So this will also increase the tax expense. The existing credit balance on the deferred tax account is 2.5 million. So deferred tax liability brought down is 2,500. 
the provision required at the end end is 4.4 million which means that deferred tax liability carried down is 4400 so this should be increased by what amount tax expense debit deferred tax liability credit by 4400 minus 2500 which is going to be 1900 so the tax expense will be further increased by 1900 and the total is going to be 2400 plus 28000 plus 1900 which is going to be 32300 so this is the total of the tax expense let's move on to the answer options and see if one option is there yes 32300 is the right answer that statement is actually not important to us the last question says that what is the amount of deferred income which speculate company should recognize in the statement of financial position as at 30th September 20x3 relating to the contract for the supply and servicing of the products so let's see the case this probably relates to the third bullet revenue where the question says that on 1st October 20x2, 1st October 20x2, Speculate Company sold one of its products for $10 million. As part of the sale agreement, Speculate Company is committed to the ongoing servicing of the product until 30th September 20x5, which is three years from the sale. So this means that apart from the product, we have also sold. Apart from the product, we have also sold some servicing. The sale value of this service has been included in the selling price of $10 million. So $10 million actually includes the, the sale value of this service. The estimated cost to speculate company for servicing is 600,000 per annum. The cost of this is 600 per annum and speculates gross profit margin on this type is 25%. So this is the cost and the margin is actually 25%. So we can say SCP profit is 25% of the selling price. So this means that the cost is actually 75% which is 600. So if 600 is 75% then what is 100%? This will be 600 divided by 75 into 100. So this means that the selling price is actually 800 per annum because 600 was also per annum and the contract relates to three years. So this means that the that the price of the servicing is actually 2400. The value of servicing is 2400 and the balancing figure of the product relates to 7600. So this is the breakup actually and this was sold on 1st October 20x2 while our year end is 20x, 20x September 30th September 20x3 so it means that one year has passed by so out of 2400 we are going to say that the one year that has passed by we can't we, we can record the revenue for that but the remaining amount of two years cannot be recorded as a revenue that will be treated as deferred income. So 800 is the revenue for each year into two is going to be 1600. The values that we are calculating are in thousands. So the deferred income to be recorded is of 1600,000. The deferred income to be recorded relates to 1600,000. Are, uh, are you people getting this working?
uh, Joe, the financial asset were equity uh, uh, instruments, so there, there there will be no interest on that. The financial asset that were uh, that we were discussing were actually equity shares, equity shares and equity shares. So that is why you are not going to calculate the interest on that. So the amount of deferred income in our answer is going to be B, which is actually sixteen hundred thousand. So let's look at one more question. Which of the following are true in respect of the income which Speculate Company has deferred at 30th September 2023? So we had actually deferred 1600, out of which 800 relates to the next year and 800 relates to year three. Total there were three years, year one, two, and three, and we were standing at the end of year one. So 800 relates to this year and 800 relates to this year. Now the question says that which of the following are true? Which of the following are true? The deferred income will be split evenly between current and non-current liabilities in speculate company statement of financial position. So yes, this is current liability and this is non-current liability. So, so the split is actually even. The same amount has been splitted between current and non-current. So yes, the first statement is actually true. The cost associated with the deferred income of speculate company should recognize in the statement of profit or loss at the same time as revenue is recognized. So when the revenue will be recognized at the same time the cost will be recognized. Yes, this is called matching concept that revenue and cost should actually match in the same accounting period. So statement one and two both are correct. Tajwari is saying sorry I was not trying to relate to the question but I would like to know the basic effective or normal. Okay let me read your question again for that. How should I calculate the finance cost? Tajwari you will be calculating the finance cost using the effective rate. If, if there are two rates given to you effective and the normal rate you will be using effective rate. The deferred income can only be recognized as revenue by speculate company when there is a signed written contract of service with its customers. No. The contract can also be an oral contract. It is not necessary to be written. When recognizing the revenue associated with service contract of speculate company, the stage of its completion is irrelevant. Not at all. The stage of completion is actually relevant. So this statement is also false. So your answer is going to be a that statement one and true are actually one and two are actually true. So we have done a lot of questions. How about trying IFRS 15 on your own at home? And if you have any problem, you people can discuss this on the WhatsApp group. Because we are exactly at par with the time. So you people can try IFRS 15 on your own at home and then you can discuss this on the WhatsApp group in case you have any problem. Okay, Alvin, I will be providing the answers of this. I will be providing the answers of IFRS 15 along to you people so that you can compare the, uh, your answers with this. If you people have any problem, you can discuss and then we'll be switching off the session. Uh, Liliana, I will be sending the answers on the WhatsApp group so that you people can um, quickly view it, uh, it on the mobile directly.
you can drop me an SMS Liliana on my contact number it is written in the PDF file as well and I've also sent it to you so you can actually drop me an SMS and I will be sending you the link group link so that you can join so that is all for today thank you everyone and I hope you people enjoyed uh, the webinar conducted by ACCA and I hope it was useful to you people I tried my level best so that I can share as much knowledge uh, as, uh, as I could we have discussed two questions of final accounts two questions of consolidation two questions of ratios two questions of cash flows approximately 20 questions of section A and approximately 20 questions of section B so approximately 20 section A 20 section B makes it 40 40 uh, uh, OT questions that we have discussed and approximately uh, eight const uh, constructed response questions that we have discussed I think the time uh, was being managed very effectively thanks to uh, 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 thanks to Allah Almighty that he has made us um, uh, possible to work so hard so thank you everyone take care and looking forward to meet you uh, in some other paper not F7 again may be possible in, in, in the P2 webinar uh, conducted by ACC in the next attempt so best of luck for the exam and study hard work hard try to make uh, as much marks as possible at least try to make 50 of them so take care thank you and Allah Hafiz